Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 35. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, when Jesus saw that he, the scribe, answered wisely, Jesus said to him, some of the saddest words in Scripture, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to question him. I want to stay in the series I've been in all the month of May. I know it's June, but I want to thread this need a little bit more and talk about the power of one. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Beloved, I am, um, Deacon Leonard Hubert, I am aware and perhaps Elder Kathy Lockhart I should add to that, that, Daryl, I am acutely aware that, Victor, you and I live not only in a world, but, Elder Ernie, we live in a time when there are certain words that border on being anathema to our culture. There are some words that our culture not only resist, but choir, there are some words that our culture outright rejects. These words are part of the, well, I, I'll say it this way, my Mary, these words were once part of the common lexicon of our nation. They, they were part of the warp and the woof and the fabric of our means of communication. These were words that we trafficked in and we used them. Uh, they belong though now to, uh, how shall I say it, to a bygone era. And we now live in this modern, highly sophisticated, highly technological world. Uh, we live in a world where these words are anathema. They are, Herschel, not just resisted, they are rejected. And, and one of those words is the word, uh, Deacon Dee, Dee that I want to lift up, look at today. We've been talking about this idea, uh, this concept, uh, this thesis, this argument of the power of one that, that you and I, and I, I, I think I have said it, but I am not sure that I have said it with specificity. 
that I have said it with clarity, that I have said it with the gravity that it demands. But, but I have sought to say throughout the month of May that you and I live in a world that is marked and known by our inability to concentrate. Uh, we, we, we are, we are. Uh, everywhere we turn, Deacon Sylvia, everywhere we turn, everywhere we look, they, they are, Deacon Skelton, these shiny objects that are aimed at distracting us and causing us to lose our focus. We get so wrapped up in them. We get so enamored with them. We become so obsessed with them that, that like trinkets, they float before us, always in front of us, sometimes peripherally, other times frontally, and everywhere we turn, every waking moment, these trinkets are used to capture our mind, preach Clark, seize our attention, cause us to lose our ability Ready to focus and pay attention. We've lost it. This, this nation, this generation knows nothing about focused attention. Our minds wander constantly. Uh, it, it is said, it is said, uh, Tanya, it is said. That right now while I'm preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the message and means by which we are saved, while I'm preaching, I am thinking in my mind, I must not preach too long because folks' attention span is not that good anymore. Preach, Clark. You, you, you put preachers, you put the pulpit under such duress, you do not allow us time to argue a passage, to exegete a text, to treat a scripture. Because while we're preaching, your mind is wandering. While I'm preaching right now, you're doing two or three things in your mind. And some of y'all so brazen, you're doing it while I'm looking at you. You're scrolling, you're going through Facebook, you're answering emails, you're balancing your checkbook. You're trying to get somebody's attention in the choir. And here I am, laboring in the word. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord abides forever and we have become so so immune to the word that we sit up under it giving the preacher a time schedule come on up doc come on doc hey up doc land the plane doc and while you trying to get me to land the plane your life is crashing we have lost the ability to focus, concentrate. Our young people, our children can't do it. They can hardly hold a conversation with us. Their minds wandering. They hardly know how to have a conversation. They'd rather tweet you or text you rather than talk to you. Come on, I, I need help behind me. You're going to sit back there, you got to help. We, 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 we live in a world, we live in a generation, we live in an age where these little trinkets, these baubles, uh, fill and infiltrate our conscious and subconscious to the degree that we've lost the ability to focus. I, I told y'all that story. I told y'all that story uh, about Dad Cray sitting on the front porch. One day I went by the house. I had gone somewhere and came back. He was sitting on the front porch, Bible in his hand. Bible wasn't no, but he was sitting on the porch in a rocking chair. And I looked at him. I said, what you doing? He looked at me as if I had two heads. 
He looked at me and he said, thinking. I looked at him like he had two heads. Beautiful summer day and you wasting it? Thinking? He was not disturbed or perturbed. He kept right on rocking. As if to look at me and say, you're disturbing me. I want to get back to thinking. I think sometimes, Pastor Kelly, you remember those Friday nights when he and Pop would play checkers for hours. Crown me. <laughs> Laughing when they would jump. You can't, you can't jump backwards. Who said we can't? You should have made that rule when we started. These two preachers going back. <laughs> for hours playing checkers. This generation ain't never played checkers. Take too long to sit down and play checkers. Take too long to play chess. They'd rather play something on their phone that blows up people. Blows folks' head off. I'm preaching whether you say amen or not. That is the culture, the times in which we live. We've lost our ability to focus. We don't pay attention. Because of that, because of that, their words, their words. I know you thought I forgot where I was. I know where I am. There are words that have become Deacon Kevin Newton anathema to us. They, they, they are almost repulsive to us. They're almost profane. And, and one of them is the word I want to look at today, and it's the word demand. We don't like that word. We don't like that word because we don't like anybody demanding anything of us. I'm three times seven. I do what I want to do. I'm grown, I work, I make my money. Nobody can tell. And so we go to work with that attitude, preach Clark. And then when our supervisor, our manager, our boss, our employer has the nerve, the unmitigated goal to correct us, we want to file on them. And our argument is, I felt uncomfortable because they were making demand. Well, you don't feel uncomfortable when you get that check. And, and the fact you get paid presupposes you have worked. I wish I had help up in here. Tap your neighbor and say, I know that's right. No, no, nah, nah, we got to get away from that. We don't like the word demand. We, no, well, let me say this. Y'all like on demand. But, 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 but on demand, I'm going to preach this, Adrian. On demand is you bossing. I feel like watching, I feel like watching, um, what, what, what's that new one uh, that Shonda Rhimes, the queen, what's her name? Queen Charlotte. I want to watch Charlotte, Queen Charlotte tonight. Y'all so deep. I'm gonna, I think I watch four. I think I watch four episodes. I'm going to do it on demand. You don't mind you demanding, but we, we get upset. When demands are made on us. Uncle George pray because they're getting ready to recoil against me. Here it is. But you can't live the Christian life. And since y'all already upset, I'll just press my claim. And you can't live a civil and civic life without assuming the responsibility that there are some demands that are placed on us. Boy, it's getting real quiet up in here. You can't be a follower of Jesus Christ without accepting the demands of discipleship. And following Jesus is not about your preferences, your likes, and your dislikes. Following Jesus is submitting and surrendering to the Lordship of Christ in your life where you follow his demands. There are some things he demands of us. But Richard Terrain, Chad, listen, son, there are some things he demands of us. I've been arguing that on Wednesdays in this obligation of the believer. Hope you'll tune in or step in. Join us. I've been working my way through the demands, the obligation of being a child of God. 
There are some things that are not optional. They are obligatory. And uh, we look at that today. And, and, and here's the thing. Here's the thing. Jesus argues. Y'all got time? Jesus argues that within the context, the confines of what we call the law, there are demands. Now, you know, I know y'all think the law is the Ten Commandments, but the real law is the first five books of the Old Testament, often called the Torah, T-O-R-A-H, the Torah, or the Torah. That's what first five books of the Bible, they really represent the law. And Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law. Starts out there in Exodus, then Leviticus, then do De Okay, y'all, okay. Y'all didn't know them books were in the Bible. Uh-huh, well, well. <laughs> Law, five books of the Bible. Not the Ten Commandments. That's the ones y'all like with Charlton Heston. No, no, the law is bigger and heavier and weightier than that. And, and, and in a dialogue, in a dialogue with some of his uh, opponents who are hoping to catch him in some misstatement about the law, uh, one of them asked Jesus, uh, and what, sir, and what, sir, do you think is the greatest commandment of all. And Pop Logan, Deacon Logan, Jesus replies, oh, that's easy. Here is the greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and Y'all was clapping on that. Y'all not going to clap on my next one. And love your neighbor whoo, as you love yourself. Jesus says that's the demand. And it's all summed up, Noel, in one word, love. You, you can take the Ten Commandments, you can take the Torah, the five books of the five first books of the Old Testament, the canon, the first canon, part of the canon of Scripture. You can take all of that and sum it up in one word, love. And, and not, not eros, not filio, not storge, but agape which is the love we have for one another because of the love God had for us. God, I wish I had a church I'd preach here today. It's love. The question, the question, question is, I got to go. question is, can we love one another? The, 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 question, the question really isn't, can we all be alike? question isn't even can we all agree. Child, you're not going to agree with anybody all the time. Okay, let me say this. I'm going to leave it alone. I'm going to leave it alone. You don't, okay, I can't speak for you. Let me, let me testify. I don't always agree with myself. Now that's a hot mess. Because <laughs> sometimes I'll be telling myself, I'm going to do so and so. And then uh, Sister Kelly, next thing I know, I'm doing something else. And I don't know where the thought to do the second thing came from. And then I have to tell myself, who's in charge here? <laughs> Y'all getting so quiet. I tell myself, I'm going to jump up out this chair and run to the refrigerator. And myself says, really? <laughs> Let's see, jump. <laughs> and I be... <laughs> and finally, I just put both hands on both sides of the chair and Pray myself up. I don't always agree with myself. You don't always agree with your spouse. Boy, it's getting quiet up in here. You don't always agree with your siblings, with your children. You don't always agree with your coworker. We don't always agree with the saints. Question isn't can we all look alike, think alike, act alike. No, the question is amid our diversity, can we love one another? I, um, on Friday, I received a text from our mayor. I don't think he'll mind me telling this. I received a text from our mayor. We're hosting 
um, the national, the U.S. Conference of Mayors here in our city. It was my privilege yesterday uh, to go down there and to uh, speak at the opening plenary, take part in the opening plenary for that conference. Uh, Friday, the mayor texted me, and uh, he said, um, we have an issue. He said, um, we have heard that there are governors who are going to send immigrants on buses to Columbus to disrupt the conference. And uh, we want to know if you uh, would help us, would First Church help us? And I responded, and they had several meetings. And uh, uh, fortunately, uh, when I talked to the mayor yesterday, uh, buses hadn't come yet. Uh, but, but, but here's my point, here's my point, here's my point. What's wrong with us? That, that, what kind of nation are we? That we would use people as pawns to prove a political point. God help me here today. What, 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 what's wrong with us? But, but Gerard, what's wrong? With, what, what, what kind of nation have we become that people mean so little to us we would put them on a bus, transport them to a place they've never been, to a place they know no one, and leave them there to try to score some political advantage. God help our nation. Can't we love people? Brown people? Hispanic people? Well, y'all getting quiet on me. Mexican people, people from El Salvador, are they not made in the image and likeness of God like we are? What is wrong with our nation? Can't we, can't we, can't we love one another? And, and Karen and Daryl, I'm almost through. Don't, don't get scared. Karen and Dow, it isn't just the, the political body politic. It, it is the church. Uh, but Chairman, one of my dear colleagues, I love him greatly, uh, Bishop Palmer, who is the resident bishop for the West Ohio Conference of the United Methodist Church. Strong preacher. Wonderful man. African American. And um, this past week in their session, they voted to release 137 churches from the Western Conference over this issue of gay rights. 137 churches separating themselves over this issue. It doesn't really matter. I think all of us as Christians have a biblical worldview of sexuality. But beyond that, can't we love people? God help me. God, God help me. God help me. What, what, Mike, what are we saying as a church? What, what are we, and it's not just the UM. It's the Presbyterian church. It's the Episcopalian church. Just Tuesday night, I had lunch, with our, dinner with our general director, uh, Dr. Jim Lyon. And, and you know that I just stepped down um, as, as chair of our assembly, the leadership of our church. And he was sharing with me that, that there has come to our movement now a proposal from within the church of God around this issue, LGBTQ+. And we talked about how our church will respond. Can't we... Love people, even when we disagree, God help me. It may not be my cup of tea, it may not be my perspective, but I must love you. When did we stop loving sinners and hating sin? When did we start hating sin and sinners? I, I close, I close. Jesus says, I have 15 minutes. Jesus says, greatest commandment, the one demand, Noel, is that you love. And 
And in Luke, the, the, the passage I got right, <laughs> in Luke, Jesus tells this story of what we call the Good Samaritan. Dr. King, as only Dr. King could preach, said that this rich young lawyer came to Jesus with a theoretical concept, raised the query and lifted the interrogative, and who is my neighbor? And Dr. King said, Jesus reached up and pulled that question out of mid-ear and slapped it on a winding road from Jerusalem to Jericho. And Jesus tells this story of the Good Samaritan. And at the heart of it is this idea of love. There are three things, and I'll let you go. First of all, notice with me the response of love. The, the Samaritan, we don't know his name, the Good Samaritan. Let's call him Sam. Good Sam. We'll call him Sam. Sam saw the man and had compassion on him. I want to try that one more time. Sam saw the man and had compassion. I want to try it one more time. Sam saw the man and had compassion on him. He, he, did not, he did not check his credentials. Trustee, Chairman Alvin Christman, you're sitting not far from Deacon Farn Holloway. He did not check Trustee Alvin Christman, Chairman, to see if he was a Kappa. Deacon Holloway, he did not search him for the black and gold. He, he saw a man preach Clark on the side of the road and he had compassion. My God, I wish somebody would help me preach. He did not check his credentials. He did not look for his resume. He did not Google him to see what HBCU or Ivy League school he went to. He saw a man on the side of the road, battered and broken and bruised and beaten and bloody. And he had somebody holler compassion on him. Isn't that what love does? Doesn't love move us to have compassion? You can Sylvia, that love on, on the Jericho Road did three things. A, it made that man stop. Oh God, some of us are so busy, we don't never stop. We don't never stop. We don't even slow down. You see somebody on the, on the side of the road uh, asking for money, your prayer life increases. Lord, let the light hold till I... <laughs> now you ain't prayed all day, now you won't pray. Lord, let that light stay green till I get through. Because we don't, we, we don't want to stop. We don't even want to slow down. It didn't just make him stop, it made him stoop. Because he had to get off his beast and stoop. Y'all missed it. We're so haughty, aren't we? We're so bougie now. We don't stop and God knows we don't stoop. It didn't just make him stop. It didn't just make him stoop. I'm going to lose all of y'all. It made him spin. But Chairman Emeritus, DP, it made him put his money where his mouth was. And I know it's not popular. We just came through this fight over the debt ceiling and all that kind of stuff. And, and I'm so sick of us balancing our budget on the backs of those who can least afford it. The last, the least, the lowest. Y'all getting quiet, but I'm preaching a real good sermon today. We don't just, we don't just stop, Deacon Kevin. We don't just stoop, but real love will make you spin. It'll make you share. It'll make you give. It'll make you help. He took that man to the nearest Holiday Inn and said, keep him here. I've got a business meeting, and when I come back, if there's any more costs, I'll pay it. I'm 
I'm going to say it. I know you don't like it online. I know you may not like it. No one should go to bed hungry in America. No child, no elderly person ought to have to choose between food and medicine. Not in America. Nobody should sleep outside. Love will make you stop. Love will make you stoop. Love will make you spin. Here's the second point. There's not just the response of love. There's the risk of love. <sighs> Jerry, the, that Jericho Road was a dangerous place. And by stopping Aunt Eula, this Samaritan put himself at risk. And beloved, you and I, I know you don't want to hear it. No, you didn't come to church for this today. I know you want me to squall and holler. But you don't act better when I do that, so I thought I'd try this. <laughs> you and I are called to do the same. I, I, I'm reading several books right now. Um, one of them, you'll hear more about it, is a, a tribute to the late uh, Dr. John R. Claypool, one of my favorite writers. Uh, the other is the newest biography of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. called King a Life. And uh, then I'm reading another book um, that I won't tell you about. But um, <laughs> while I'm reading this new book on Dr. King, I, I was struck this week by the courage of those men and women and even those children who were engaged and involved in the modern civil rights movement and the risk that they took. It was not just the risk of going to jail, but uh, it was the risk of losing their jobs. It was the risk of losing status. For, and I said this yesterday at the uh, National Council of Negro Women in their 40th anniversary, and it wasn't just black folk, white people in the South. Uh, the author talks about white professors and white businessmen and white socialites who, who took the risk of driving black people during the bus boycott. They risked losing status and they risked losing friends. And, are you ready for this? And they risk losing their lives. All because they believed in the movement. Here's why. Because love has risk. It has no guarantees. Doesn't have any. There's no guarantee. Some of y'all, I'm, I'm going to do some marital counseling right now. If you thinking, child, I'm in love, I done found somebody, Ooh, child, if you think that comes with a guarantee, love has no guarantees. Y'all getting quiet on me. Let me tell you what they don't guarantee. Somebody says, please don't. Yes, I must. There's always the risk that your love will not be received. You ever love somebody and they didn't want it? <laughs> Look straight at me. Look straight at me. <laughs> don't, 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 don't be hunching. Just look straight at me. Keep your elbow down. You ever loved anybody they didn't receive it? There's the risk that love will not be reciprocated. You ever had a one-way love affair? It was all going out from you. And wasn't nothing coming back in the other direction? You giving all the love and getting no love in return? I wish I had an honest church here today. The risk of love is um, it won't be received. There's the risk of love that it won't be reciprocated. And, and, and here's the one that really got me as I was working on this, Tanya. And I'm the one working on it and it got me. There's the risk that love won't even be recognized. You ever love somebody and they don't even know it? 
Okay, stay with me. Larry, Wanda, stay with me. They don't know it because what they call love is so far from what love is. They can't recognize love when it walks up on them. Somebody say amen so I know I'm not just talking out here in the ether world. Do I have anybody in here who ever took the risk of love that it would not be received, it might not be reciprocated, and really there's sometimes it's not even recognized. But guess what? You've got to run the risk of loving anyhow because okay I'm going to say it I'm going to say it love is never ulterior it's not utilitarian it loves despite the fact it's not received or not reciprocated or not recognize. I was thinking about this the other day, again, thinking about Dr. King, and I was thinking about how he kept telling folks to love Bill Connor and Jim Clark, and I was thinking to myself, man, this is 50 years later, and I don't want to love them jokers, and they both did. I don't want to love them. But it hit me. I'm going to write on this. It hit me that you and I have to learn the art of hating evil but loving those who do it. Okay, y'all can hear. <laughs> Means you gotta love Mr. Trump. You gotta love him. Y'all getting quiet on me. You gotta love those folk who ransacked our Capitol on January 6th, but you also gotta say they were not patriots. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm talking about your cousins. I'm sorry, because y'all. No, 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 I love them, but they're not patriots. Patriots don't sack the Capitol. Patriots don't defecate in the rotunda. Patriots don't try to hang the vice president. Y'all can cry on me. Patriots don't beat up police officers who give themselves to protect us. But we must love them. Okay, y'all getting quiet. And we must love those in our own community who break in our houses, who beat up our children, who rob our elderly. It doesn't mean we approve of what they do, but we must love them. Getting real quiet up in this church today. Because all the folk hurting us ain't white. Some of them look just like you. Oh, shucks. Some of them got your last name. That's why you put up stuff when they come to the house. Just a minute. Don't laugh. <laughs> Who is it? Oh, just a minute. I'm getting dressed. What you're doing is hiding your jewelry. <laughs> you love them, but you don't trust them. Little you, but don't laugh. You don't trust them. You know them. To know them is to love them. <laughs> to love them is to know them. There's always that risk. But then here's the third. I have three minutes. There's the return or the reward of love. Pastor Kelly, you know what shook me? I've been preaching going on 50 years. I've been preaching. And... Um, I, I promise you, I didn't preach the Good Samaritan. I don't know how many times. I just realized something when I was working on this series. The Bible doesn't tell us what becomes of that man. Doesn't tell us. There's no, and he lived happily ever after in this. We're not told what becomes of him. We don't know what becomes of the man who was the recipient of this amazing, astounding love. But here's what we do know, Helen. Are you ready for this? This, is, this shouted me in my study. Here's what we do know. He lived. God, I feel the Holy Ghost right there. He didn't die on that road alone. He didn't bleed out on the side of the road. 
Y'all y'all not hearing me. He didn't expire on that road, his blood running into the dirt. He did not die on the side of that road, the victim of the meanness and the malady of his age and the people around us. Somebody holler, he did not die. That man lived. God, I feel like preaching this because Sam came along. God, y'all missed it because Sam showed up. Because Sam was willing to see and stop and stoop and spin. We don't know the man's name. We don't know where the man worked. But here's what we can shout about. The man lived. And I wonder, is there anybody around you today that you want to live in spite of what's happened in their lives? Okay, I got to go. Come on, Winston. Let's go to work. Would you turn to a neighbor? Say, neighbor, there's some folk in my life who made bad decisions. There's some folk in my life who made some dumb mistakes but I don't want them to die in the shape they're in and the condition they're in. I don't want them to die in their sin because I want them to live. Would you turn 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 to one of your neighbors say neighbor I want them to live in spite of the mess, in spite of the failure, in spite of their faults and their shortcomings. Is there anybody in your life that you want them to live? Is there any unsaved person in the circle of your influence and you say, I pray for them every day because I want them to live. They're on the side of the road battered and broken by life but I want them to live how can they live I'm glad you asked if you will share with them the good news of the gospel if you will sacrifice some of your time to witness to them and if you stand in the gap I promise you there's a real good chance in spite of how life has beat them up they will live if you will share with them, if you will sacrifice a little bit of your time, and if you will stand in the gap in intercessory prayer, they will live. Well, good morning, y'all. We got to serve the supper, and I got to get up out of here, but I look for some Christology in the context and the challenge, and I found some Christology. You know what I found? I was on the roadside. I was broken, battered, bruised, and bleeding, but he climbed a hill called Calvary, gave his hands to the nails, gave his feet to the spikes, gave his head to the crown of thorns, gave his side to the spear. He died until death died. He died until the whole account was settled. He died until it was well with my soul. He died until peace like a river attended my way. He died until the old burdens of my heart rolled away. He died until blood flowed and the moon stopped shining and the sun stopped glowing. He died until the Roman centurion said surely this must be the son of God he died till dead folk got up and walked all over Jerusalem he died so I could get up he died so I could live he didn't let me die in my sin in my transgression in my filth in my pollution somebody holler he died so I could live amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost now I'm found was blind but now I see when we've been there 10,000 years bright shining as the sun we've no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun I ain't asked y'all in a long time can I ask you one question 
in light of what he did, in light of the fact he died, in light of the fact he gave himself so you could be saved, can I ask you one question? Ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? Ain't he, ain't he, ain't he, ain't he? Oh, shucks. Ain't he all right? He walks with me, talks with me, tells me I'm his own, and the joy, the joy we share while we tarry there, none other's ever known. Ain't he all right? Yeah. Ain't he all right? I tried him. I know he's all right. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained with him, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing from the water, lifting me, now safe am I. What did it love? Lifting me, love, lifting me with nothing else. Love, love, lifting me. That's the demand on us today. Not that we agree, not that we see things eye to eye, but that we love God and one another. Everybody standing. Everybody standing.